I am the winemaker and viticulturist for Dot Wines, and welcome to our session this afternoon, New Gen Old Wine. Um, it's very exciting to be with all of you here today during the 2020 harvest, um, a very fun and frenetic time for all of us. I would like to introduce our uh, panels, our panel here, uh, starting off with Nicole Bacicalupi from Bacicalupi Vineyards. Hello. And on to uh, from Enriquez Estate, Cecilia Enriquez. There she is, lovely. And on to Pellegrini Wine Company, Alexia Pellegrini. Hi. Hello. And finally, um, uh, last but certainly not least, from Ramey Wine Cellars, Alan Ramey. Hey there. Thanks for joining. So all of you, thank you so much for joining us today. It's very exciting to be with the new gen, which I like to call the next gen. Um, and I just wanted to talk to you guys about a couple questions today. First, um, let's start with um, let's start with Cecilia, if you don't mind talking about your winery and also your personal history in the wine industry. It would be great to hear that. Uh, yeah, well, thank you for having me. Um, lovely to be on this and, and chat with everybody when it's such a chaotic time. Um, it's nice to kind of have an excuse to sit down and relax for a little bit. Um, my history is a little bit different. I'm actually first generation into wine. I'm from New Jersey. Uh, I moved out here in 2011 to uh, learn how to farm and make wine. My parents and I came out here in 2009 and we just kind of instantly fell in love with Sonoma County. My dad's a physician and has always liked the kind of the chemistry and science behind winemaking. And my mom in Mexico, um, her grandfather was a huge landowner um, in agriculture. And so we've had this kind of history in ag for a while and my dad's always kind of wanted to get back into it. He is kind of crazy. Um, most people have these things that they want to do before they die, like a list of things they want to do. My dad has a list of businesses he wants to do and one was getting back into ag. And so when we came to Sonoma County, we stumbled upon it. It was a ski trip that all went wrong. And um, we were shooting for San Francisco, but made it to Santa Rosa instead and tried some wines out here. And I was right out of college, didn't like wine. East Coast wine isn't that great. And um, I tried the first couple wineries and I told my dad whatever he was buying at home was crap and he really needed to stock up on wine from out here. And um, what was supposed to be one night in wine country turned into the entire week. And a year and a half later, my dad found a property in Petaluma that he ended up purchasing and shipped me out here to learn how to farm and make wine. So they're still back in New Jersey. I've kind of attached myself to anybody that would let me to learn how to farm and make wine and kind of develop my own style. And I'm still here 10 years later. So it's pretty exciting. That is so awesome. I love how I'm glad I feel like it's our game that your ski trip went so poorly. So that is so great. So yeah, life um, has a way of putting you where you need to be. Exactly. That's, that's very true. So speaking of that, I guess your journey is relatively newish for you. Um, what, what, what wines are you most passionate about making? Which ones are you not necessarily the proudest of because I'd never make you pick a kid, but what, what are you the most passionate about and fired up about? Well, considering I didn't know the difference between red and white when I moved out here, um, I started with the main basics. My, my dad loves Pinot Noirs and Fendel, um, stayed away from whites. And then as I started to get to know wine country, I kind of really developed a um, passion for unique varietals. So Tempranillo, we happen to have Tempranillo on our property. So I make a Tempranillo. I absolutely love Tempranillo. A couple years ago, um, I stumbled upon Tanat. So I've started making some Tanat. Um, whites, I'm really into whites now and I make a white blend and I do a dry muscat, which is kind of fun and, and different. So uh, every year I have a kind of an idea of what I'm gonna go into harvest doing and then it is completely different from at the end of harvest. So uh, kind of just playing. I, I like to play and just kind of see what happens with unique varietals. I love that. I think being a new gen and then working on these amazing, cool, kind of fun hipster varieties is so exciting. And um, I'm a really bad moderator because I forgot to tell everybody tuning in all of the housekeeping things I should have done um, and all the many questions. When she said Tanat, I'm like, there's going to be a thousand questions about Tanat and Tempranillo. So um, bad moderator me, if you do have a question and you're tuning in and watching, 
please um, put, um, add your questions on to the chat option. And if you look into the chat option as well, you'll see that um, uh, the opportunity to purchase uh, wines from these amazing uh, new gen winemakers um, is listed there. So please check out the chat option and we'll make sure we get your questions as we're going through it. But back to you, Cecilia, on um, the very exciting varieties that you're working on, um, which are, I'm very excited about them as well. What is your future vision for your winery? You, you know, how, how are you gonna grow with these, these kind of cool, fun varieties? I think so. I mean, I love Pinot. I love the standard cabs and, you know, Sauv Blancs and the ones that everybody and their mom recognizes. But I, I also, because I didn't come from wine, I think I have, I love pushing people to try things they haven't been exposed to. Um, and I would like to kind of further develop that because I'm so small. I produce about 600, 700 cases annually, and we just do tastings by appointment only because I only have one employee. Um, it's kind of an opportunity to sit down and tell people that wine isn't snobby or snooty. Like it's just a fun thing that brings people together and um, you're enjoying usually good food and good company and good wine. Um, so I kind of like to do that. And I mean, I get it all the time, I, especially with my Muscat. I'm like, you know, oh, Muscat, it's sweet. I don't want it. Or people that are like, oh, it's sweet. I want it. And I'm like, oh shoot, sorry to disappoint both categories. It's actually a dry, it's a dry muscat. Um, just try it, hopefully you like it. And if not, you know, we can move on to something else, but at least get a basis of what it tastes like so that you can kind of have that moving forward. Um, so it's, I just love kind of bringing people into wine and, and realizing that um, what you think about wine, once you get to know wine, it's not really, you know, the stereotypical thought processes behind wine. Awesome. And then one final question for you, and then we're going to um, head to our other panelists and we're going to circle back to everybody today to go through your library wines. So to kind of tease people out and kind of keep you going. But Cecilia, you know, you're, you're, you're not only new generation, but you, in, in many ways, you're first generation with both uh, wine grape growing and with winemaking. And I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who would be very interested in knowing what advice you have for those who don't have that background, um, you know, could you give advice to that next generation or that first generation coming in to viticulture or enology? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, coming from the East Coast to the West Coast, um, especially Sonoma County, it's really welcoming. Um, people are super friendly. They're willing to kind of take you under their wing, regardless of what wine knowledge you have. Um, and you know, I wouldn't be here today without everybody that's helped me, but don't be scared. I mean, it, it really is a, an approachable industry and um you know wine is a continuously learning thing like they're every year it's different every varietal is different every region is different so um there's very few people that i would you know say that knows everything about wine so we're all learning together and it doesn't matter at what stage of wine you're in um we're just excited to be there together and and kind of learn together through it awesome thank you cecilia Thank well, you. let's see. That was really great. Let's move on now to Nicole Bacigalupi. Thank you for joining us today, Nicole. And Thank I'm you for having you, me. You got it. Um, could you please introduce your winery and also um, tell us a bit about what varieties you make there and what it's known for. And then we would love to know your personal history. Sure. So hi, everybody. I hope you're enjoying some good wine at home and um, learning a little bit about each of our brands. Um, we are Bacha Galupi Vineyards here in Russian River Valley on the northern part of um, Russian River. We are uh, 65 years of experience here farming grapes. Um, I would say the primary varietals that we're known for would be Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Um, we're in a cool climate for the most part, but we also do grow a little bit of Zinfandel and Petit Syrah. So um, it's a pretty diverse uh, vineyard and plantings and where we are in um, Russian River is technically called the Middle Reach. So it's uh, the warmest pocket of the overall cool Appalachian of Sonoma County, which is of Russian River, excuse me, which is how we can kind of grow that diverse offering. Um, it's a really special piece of property for sure. Um, we've got great history in Russian River. Um, probably two of the pivotal events that we've sort of built our foundation on um, would be planting Chardonnay and Pinot Noir in the early 60s. Um, when a lot of growers were kind of just planting whatever they could find and um, sort of shooting from the hip. And there wasn't a ton of research at that point of what varietals were gonna grow well here. And 
um, Charles and Helen, who are my grandma and grandpa and the original founders of the property, um, kind of took a chance and um, on the advice of uh, the Ag Commissioner at UC Davis, started planting those two bridles here in 1964. So um, that and along with um, providing some grapes to a pretty um, pivotal event in history, which was the Judgment of Paris. Um, our Chardonnay fruit was about 40% of that wine. So those two events, I would say the winery is most well known for, although um, I don't like to hang my hat on any one particular part of our history. So we're always trying to, you know, make our best wine, so which we haven't done yet. So um, I, you know, grew, grew up in the industry. Um, my childhood memories are the humming of the tractor outside my window and the lights of the tractor um, at 2 a.m. So I definitely was um, immersed into ag at a very young age, um, kind of organically grew to love it. I started out at a really small winery in Dry Creek after uh, college just to see if this was the industry that I wanted to go into and I kind of did a little bit of everything and um, after shortly after I ended up going uh, to Silver Oak Winery where I worked for four years and I did everything at the winery from production to marketing, wholesale, packaging, um, just kind of did every little field that I could. And um, simultaneously also started building this brand and um, building our tasting room where we're, we're at right now. That is awesome. And I, I, I apologize. I did not know that you guys were, your family's grapes were part of that historic tasting as well. So that's very, very cool. And thank you for sharing that with us today. <laughs> Wow. So your, your story is so inspiring because you're, you're not a first generation wine grape grower, but you are a first generation winemaker and winery owner, correct? Uh, well, it's a family business. My um, grandma and grandpa originally started the vineyards um, and a label as well in the 80s. Um, and then my mother and father currently operate, you know, they're in charge of the day-to-day -day operations of the vineyard and the winery. And then my sister and I also kind of handle a lot of the managerial things and we do a little bit of everything. So it's, it's definitely family operation. It is, um, you know, a team effort. We have a consulting winemaker that we also work with um, to make the wine behind the scenes. But it's, yeah, it's definitely not just me. <laughs> That is true. That is true. But speaking about you, I mean, ha are, have, you, have you found ways to, um, because it is so generational and, and, and historical, have you found ways to uh, innovate? Have you put your own stamp on any of the processes or even wine styles or, or variety selections? You know, um, innovation for farming is kind of an interesting subject. It's, you know, especially wine in general, it's a really traditional industry. I think you know, we've come and techniques have really developed and evolved. And obviously we're all using a lot of technology right now with COVID um, to sell wine and market our wines. Um, social media is, you know, definitely something I think all three of us are using a lot to promote and sell our product um, just because we can't see guests in person. Um, I think we're always trying to innovate and we're always looking for ways to grow grapes in a more sustainable fashion, um, you know, ways to make better wine, but still be true to the vineyard. So I think you have to be careful with innovation because um, we want to express the purity of the product, which comes from ag. And so sometimes not messing with nature is the best way to um, express your wine. Uh, that's kind of what we found. So. We do innovate, but we also want to be careful that we're not messing with Mother Nature too much on the winemaking end. Well, speaking of speaking of uh, not messing with Mother Nature, actually, um, I was going to keep questions till the end, but it is pertinent to your story and your situation. And I think there's no better person on the panel to explain this, but someone did have a question about explaining the middle reach. And I think you explained yes. it really well. But um, could you explain the Middle Reach and, and maybe refer to the other areas of the Russian River Valley um, ABA as well? I would love to. Um, so this has been a kind of a discovery project for Russian River Valley wine growers over the last probably eight years. Um, you know, Russian River is a very large Appalachian and it encompasses a lot of different microclimates and um, sub Appalachians, if you will, although that's not a technical term, that's sort of what we use in house. Um, and because it's so large, each of the different microclimates 
really um, express different terroirs and different flavor profiles and characteristics, especially in Pinot Noir, because it is such a chameleon of where it's grown. Um, and so the middle reach where Vachagalupi is, um, is a stretch off mostly West Side Road, which is the northern part of Russian River. Um, and what's unique about us is we see a very large diurnal shift. I know that's a really big kind of confusing word, but essentially what it means is we see the largest swing in temperatures of all of Russian River. So we can be in the 50s in the morning and we can go all the way up to the 100 degrees midday during our prime ripening season. So um, it's unique in that we can do a lot of diverse varietals because we're cool enough for Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, but we get warm enough daytime temperatures that we can ripen things like Zinfandel and Petit Syrah and Syrah that tend to have a little bit thicker skin that need that daytime heat. So um, we've got Laguna Ridge, Sebastopol Hills, um, Green Valley, which is all, it, it is technically a microclimate, a subregion of Russian River. It's the coolest part of the valley, which some of these folks can definitely chime in about because they make some beautiful wines from those Appalachians. Um, so yeah, I, I encourage anyone that loves Pinot Noir to like dive a little bit deeper into these different neighborhoods that we're calling them and really start to like explore what those places express because we'll find you, you love certain neighborhoods and um, microclimates more than others. Thank you. That was that really explained it quite well. So thank you so much. Well, on to Alexia Pellegrini. Alexia, could you please tell us a bit about your family's winery? And then we would love to hear your history as well. Sure. Um, so I am a fourth generation in the family business of wine. Uh, the first Pellegrini wine was uh, uh, produced in 1925 after my uh, great grandfather had immigrated over from Tuscany to our little part of Russian River, which is basically a sister ci city to Luca, where the family is from. And uh, each generation has had their own contribution to the wine business. Um, uh, we were we didn't have property in the 20s because prohibition started, but we were grape dealers for many of the growers, uh, old Italian families that were in in Sonoma County, also creating quite a bit of bootleg uh, Sonoma County wine in San Francisco, uh, where the majority of the family still is today. Um, we had our sales, uh, a, a distribution company, an import company that was started by my great grandfather um, after World War II and our estate uh, vineyard Olivet Lane. Uh, the land for that was purchased in 73 um, by my grandfather and my father and grandmother and planted to our vineyard in 75. So it's a historic planting of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay and Russian River. And that is where our estate winery is today. Um, uh, we have uh, the winery itself is built to um, do about 30,000 cases. At one point, we had multiple vineyards up all as far up as Alexander Valley. Um, but now we're just focused on what is within miles of our, our winery estate. Um, our, my history in wine started in 2000 with my first uh, wine class at the Santa Rosa JC and then a uh, subsequent internship at Pinfolds and then coming back and working at St. Francis and eventually um, working for the family, um, first for the distribution company um, and then in the winery. Um, and I've worked all positions um, uh, uh, from the seller to basically, well, I run the operation now. So in 2017, um, I took the lead um, and my father is now retired, but he is sitting on the couch right behind me. He wanted to participate today. <laughs> um, so uh, it, it's quite the operation for, um, we sell grapes to um, a number of uh, luminary uh, wineries in Russian River, William Selium, Gary Farrell, Dariush, well, they're in Napa, but we picked for them last night, uh, McCrosty. Um, and Mary Edwards, who was our winemaker for 11 years um, and started her production in our winery, um, however many years ago that was, and she just retired. Um, yeah. <laughs> awesome. So my first burning question for you, Alexia, is what, what brought you to join 
the fan, you know, you said, well, my history started in 2000. What was the spark for you? What was the drive? What was the passion for you? The reason why you came into it? So many, you see so many, you and, and the other multi-generational um, folks on this panel are so special, especially to your parents and your father sitting behind you. Because, you know, we work so hard at what we do and you hope your children join it, but sometimes they don't. And so my question for you is, what was that, what was the passion driving you in? Um, well, I am one of eight in my generation that was interested in wine and pursued it um, as a career. So that it, it wasn't for everyone, but we all grew up in San Francisco. So um, uh, it was uh, definitely a little bit far reaching. So I would come up and see the harvest a little bit, but um, that wasn't in my backyard. In, uh, when I was 20 years old, I took my first wine class. Um, basically, I got bribed to take it for um, some rent money from my dad. And um, I had I, it, that being out in the vineyards and it was some vineyard that we were touring with like Rich Thomas in the middle of Dry Creek where I just all clicked and I was like, I get this. Like, uh, cause I was already had a green thumb and like do and mechanical and I mean that comes in very handy when you're running a winery. I mean, my it, you need a large set of tools to get everything done on a daily basis. So um, um, yeah, that was the trigger. And then the the internship out in Australia, and you know, then building that community and just it kept going from there. Um, I was in art school prior to that, so, um, and I didn't really see a career in figure drawing in the future, but at this point where I also now have a design degree and the wine uh, MBA behind me and the 20 years of experience, um, all of those things come together. So I'm responsible for designing all of our packaging as well as all of the collateral and build outs at the winery and um, so it's very hands-on on a daily basis. Very cool. Thank you for sharing that with us. So as, a, as someone with an art background and a mechanical background who now is running a vineyard um, and you're multi-generational and your feet are very heavily into it, what is your vision for Pellegrini um, going into the future? It seems like a very cool combo to have that art background fueling that. Um, so I think for our vineyard, especially, we've sold a lot of our grapes for many years. And for primarily we, from our own Olivet Lane vineyard, we only had our two SKUs, our barrel fermented Chardonnay, our barrel fermented Pinot Noir. And um, since taking over, I have expanded that um, from, uh, let's see, we do sparkling. Um, we started sparkling in 2008. And now this year we did a Blanc de Blanc and a Blanc de Moors. Um, and we have our estate um, uh, old vine rosé. We I did a nouveau pinot noir starting in eighteen as nineteen as well. So we're continuing with that program. We did a late harvest uh, uh, chardonnay uh, and also made brandy from some chardonnay leaves. Um, so that's kind of like a white port style that we just bottled. Um, it, it's uh, as using our property for as many different SKUs to showcase it as pos possible at this point. And also just having fun with um, other outside varietals that, um, you know, might appeal to uh, my generation and um, uh, not calling it natural wine, but, um, you know, we've always had an unadorned wine making style, but just being more conscious about that, being conscious about our farming, uh, we're certified sustainable, glycophate free, um, and just uh, keep on chipping away and being better and better stewards of the property. Very cool. And I, I like the um, I like your term instead of natural wine and unadorned. That's that's unadorned wine making style. That's very <laughs> cool. Well, on to um, as someone who can speak of most regions in, in the Russian River Valley, um, Alan Ramey from Ramey Wine Cellars. Alan, thank you so much for being here with us today. Could Pleasure. you please tell us, thank you. Could you please tell us a bit about your, uh, your family's winery and then also um, your personal history, a bit of that? Sure, yeah. Uh, 
we were started, I'm a, compared to Alexia, I'm, I'm a measly second generation. I'm, we're not up to four quite yet. Um, but uh, we were started by my folks back in uh, 1996. So my dad had been making wines, establishing wineries like, like Dominus, Rudd, um, Matanzas Creek, Chalk Hill, uh, Samey way back in the day with, um, with Zelma Long. And, and so he had a bit of a, a you know, sort of a, uh, he was known for making good wine. And so he and my mom started the, the company in, in 96 when Dominus wasn't making any uh, white wines. And so his boss, Chris John Wex said, well, uh, you can make a little Chardonnay on the side. So that's how we got started, was making a little Chardonnay next door at a Luna winery over on the Napa side back then. And a um, little facility that I'm sitting in right now opened up and we, and we moved in. And, and, and luckily enough, um, people really like the wines. We've gotten great reviews over the years. Um, Decanter put us on their front cover of the magazine for best shards in the world. Um, Wine Spectator this year had us on the top 10 wines in the world for, for one of ours. Um, a lot of great scores from, from critics, you know, in, in, in Europe, like Francis Robinson and Bob Parker. So luckily, luckily we've, 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 you know, keep chipping away and we've, we've done well. Um, and that's, you know, in large part, thanks to my folks and what, and what they've, they've accomplished. And, and since then, uh, I've joined as well as, um, like, like Nicole, I've also got a, a sister in the project, my sister Claire, who's very much involved in the, in the vineyard side of things. Um, and, uh, and so that's kind of our, our long, you know, <laughs> in a very wee nutshell where, where we're from, um, how I got involved. Um, I, was, I was running away at the time. I, I went to college and I went to the East Coast and then that wasn't far enough away. So I studied abroad in Europe and I, I joined this wine, blind wine tasting club. And I, I was, you know, buying wines by myself for the first time because they'd always been put in front of me. Here's a wine to drink. And I'd never really gone out and explored myself. And all of a sudden I was alone in Europe and I could buy whatever I wanted, you know, within my, my, my limited price range, of course. And, and, uh, and, I, and I started really getting into it once I had a little more uh, uh, authority over what I could drink. And so I kind of came home and, and surprised my folks by saying I, I, I wanted to, to join. And then I I went abroad to do cellar work at um, in Chile and then in, in Burgundy in France. And uh, now my sister and I have gone on to do a UC Davis certificate in wine and got all our recs in chemistry and, and whatnot. So we're sort of going down that path, but I'm, I'm very lucky that I get a chance to work. You know, I designed our wine club. I get to go on the road a little bit. I sit in the winemaking room. I, I get a chance to do a little bit of everything. So I'm, I'm, I'm sort of viewing myself as being a sponge and trying to be creative and innovate where I can, but also trying to learn um, from all the, the knowledge that we're lucky to have here at the time. Very cool. Well, Alan, what are the, so you, you mentioned it, you, you want to innovate where you can. What innovations have you done? And then what do you, what's on like the immediate, I don't want to scare your whole family here. So what's on the immediate horizon? Like, like let's sneak, sneak peek on the innovations just around the corner. Well, you know, it's funny you mentioned yeah. that because I, here, here's the sad truth is just today I was I'm really excited about doing this new thing in the cellar but we just got news at lunch today just before I got on here that we're gonna have to cancel cancel two vineyards because of smoke tank and so I'm worried that I won't actually be able to do my experiment we're gonna wait and see I mean as you know I mean myself as well as everyone on the panel and mo most folks in Sonoma County we're not gonna release bad wine we're not gonna release some sort of smoke tank so that, that, you know, for the consumers sitting in your rooms thinking, oh, I'm never going to buy the 2020 vintage. The first thing I have to say is, is don't worry. We're, 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 we're decent enough people not to put that on you. We, we, we can sell in the bulk market and, and the sort of big corporations can do their mechanical magic to it and sell it at the bottom shelf. We're sort of the family operations that would, would never do something like that to folks. Um, but, uh, but no, I, I've been reading, um, it was, it's kind of a tricky thing following my, my dad's footsteps because he's, he knows so much. And my whole life I've been sort of like when I came back from Burgundy, I had all these ideas, this big notebook in French that I was trying to put things on. And, and it's really sad because I would say, dad, what, what about this idea? And he said, I've done that experiment in the eighties. This is the results I've done it. And it's like that conversation that's happened so many times. It's annoying. I finally started reading outside the wine world. I really love tea, Asian, Chinese, Japanese, tr traditional teas. I started reading books on that topic and about how they pick them by hand and literally down to the, the leaf. And I started thinking, well, what if you apply that, to that, that, that technique to wine and start literally picking berry by berry? Now, some people, as you know, in, in Germany, you know, for berry, truck and berry and auslaces do this, but, it, but it's, it's from the vine. I wanted to try this in the winery itself and sort of just try to get the most quality possible or see if it's not worth it, it doesn't apply. I wanted to do that experiment this year. 
Um, but we'll, we'll see if I can. But anyways, that's an example of a type of thinking that I'm trying to bring to the winery while respecting traditions, but also sort of looking at different areas to see what, what can we provide to this industry that's different. I, I want to see what your sister is going to say in, in on the viticulture side. If you say, okay, we're, we're going to pick each berry and then we're going to choose. <laughs> Gonna she thinks I'm crazy. One berry. <laughs> she, she's the smart one. <laughs> well, you know, they have small ferment and you could do single berry ferment, you know, the little. I, that there's be... a video on that. It's hilarious. I love, I I love know. that video. For the folks yeah. who haven't seen it, search single berry ferment on YouTube. Yeah, it's hilarious. It's like this little, little thing. Yeah. Um, that, that is so exciting. Well, okay, so you, you kind of, you've, you've touched on, you touched on several topics that I know we're probably gonna get a thousand questions on today. Um, and, but one, one I kind of wanted to pull back on for you, which was really interesting is you did touch on the topic where you're having these conversations with your dad, you're trying to innovate and he's like, Oh, I've already done that. Like I've already done that. I've already done that. And, um, and I, and when I, when you said that, I'm not going to say who, cause I could see everybody on the screen. Some people were like, <laughs> yeah, but, you know, I got the look. So what's your, I mean, what's your advice about that? How do you approach innovation in a very traditional fabric? You know, how, how do you approach that while working with family? That, that's a tough thing to juggle. Do you like how I avoided smoke taint at all costs on that right there? <laughs> do you like that? I danced it. Clever. You're, you're I danced away. Moderator. <laughs> look over here. Yeah, I'll show you. Oh, well, well, um, yeah. I think that you know the, the, the balance you're, you're getting at the point of innovation versus tradition and, and Nicole touched on this she had a good point is a lot of times tradition is the, the better way to go forward there's a lot of technology that does not necessarily make wine better and so I think the the the, the knee-jerk reaction for someone with a lot of money to come in this business and say oh I've got to get this hundred thousand dollar berry sorting machine and just saying oh well it's the most expensive thing therefore it's better and you know, there's a, some wine critics out there that might sort of be fooled by saying they're throwing resources at it, therefore better wine. You know, some technology does make things better, sometimes it doesn't. And so you, you sort of have to walk that fine line um, on the technological side as, as well as just trying new innovations. Not all new winemaking innovations might taste good. There's a lot of times I'm sitting around, I'm in a lot of blind tasting groups with, with people and, and we have a wine and we go around the table and everybody says, oh, it's, it's, it's interesting. And, and nobody really says it's good. And I, th I think we're in a generation right now where there's so much of a, an impetus to just try something new. And then after a while we realized, eh, maybe, maybe it was interesting, but maybe it, it really didn't move the ball forward in a way that, that just makes better wine. And so that's something you always need to be aware of. And you ask how I approach it. I mean, my, my approach is to very, you know, I, I read my own stuff. And then when I'm curious, I go to my dad and I, I ask him, hey, dad, you've been reading this. Have you done it? And sometimes he'll say yes. And sometimes he'll say, oh, yeah, I don't, I don't think I have. And then, and then that leads forward to the opportunity to try it out. So we've done a, a few things uh, like that. But I think the moral of the story is just to have a respectful conversation with your, your, your folks or your, your elders, wherever they might be, see if they've done it if they have, see what lessons they learned, if they haven't, see if it's worthwhile, try it out, and then taste it and, and see if it's good. I mean, I remember I, the, the sort of native natural wine movement is interesting and, and sort of historical kefevery things are kind of cool. And I, I go to the Hillsburg Library with all these ancient wine history textbooks that sometimes I go and just read these for, for fun because I'm wearing glasses and I'm a nerd. And, and they talked about how in the ancient world, they used to transport wine across the Mediterranean with olive oil. And I thought, ooh, that's interesting. What would it be like to add olive oil? So I just bought some, brought some wine home with me and added olive oil to it and set it in my kitchen and let it sit for a while to see what that tastes like. It was disgusting. It was horrible. I would never put that on anyone in my life. So I think there's, 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 you've got to follow your dreams and be into, be, try this industry out. There's so much to learn, but you also have to know when not to do something. And I've made a few of those mistakes myself. Have we all have we all have Alan? So thank you. Well, let's let's switch let's switch gears really fast. Um, and um, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna keep going around the wheel here. So, um, uh, Miss Cecilia, um, do you have a moment to discuss your library wines? Let's do a little library wine roundtable here. Yeah. So I you know I'm, I haven't been along that long. So I decided to just go with something from my first vintage, which was 2009. My Dad was smart when we came out here in 2009 to actually negotiate to have grapes 
um, and to, to make our wine elsewhere until we found the right property and, you know, kind of get the business together. Um, so 2009 was technically my first vintage. It was the first time that I was flying multiple times through the year um, out here to learn how, what the process was throughout the year and, and taste and bring home samples to my parents. So it was kind of like a way to ease myself into the industry. Um, the reserve just ends up being about 100 cases worth, and um, it came from the Petaluma property that we ended up purchasing initially, which was 30 acres right off of Adobe Road on East, in East Petaluma. Um, mostly Pinot Noir. I mean, at that point, I think it was a perfect property for us to start with because I was mostly a grower and just selling a bunch of grapes, and um, we had a production facility on site that kind of allowed me to squeeze in my small production, but um, definitely near and dear to my heart. I, that was the first year where I was like, I'm gonna hold back X amount of cases for library. And then I quickly realized that you don't really need that many pieces of library wine. So I figured I would um, showcase that one. I still have um, probably 10 cases left of it in my, uh, at the property there in, in my personal wine cellar and figured I, I would uh, bring it out. It is on my website. Um, I don't know if I have it set for just wine club only, but you can always reach out to me directly and tell, tell me that you heard it on this and want to try it and scope it out. And I'd be happy to, to, to share some with you guys. And so speaking of this wine, um, I don't know if you've had a chance to, to try it quite recently, um, but what, uh, what flavor profiles and what sort of structure were you going for? What sort of style and, and uh, yeah. Yeah, um, well, I didn't really know what I was doing. <laughs> so I kind of took a lot of lead from um, the winery that kind of helped us make it and, um, you know, kind of went off of what was standard for Pinot Noir. Uh, it does come from the Petaluma property, like I mentioned, and we did use 25% new French oak. Um, kind of really realized that Petaluma Gap is a lot colder climate than Russian River, where we're located now, actually. Um, and so it's kind of just like super small berries that are really concentrated. Um, they have slightly thicker skin. So kind of learned that it has a, a good mixture of, for ageability and um, just darker berry flavors, dark, uh, more Burgundian in a sense. So. I love it. I think it was great. I'm, I mean, I hopefully that kind of answered your, your question. Um, they're all so small that they're all very different. I mean, if I wish I could have you guys all over and just do a, a complete vertical, um, just so you can see how different it is since they're, they're all super small production to go back with everybody, what they were saying about staying true to the vineyard. I've, I think coming, not coming from wine and realizing and going wine tasting in cinema and other regions, um, I think that's one of the reasons that Sonoma County has really done well in the past and has gotten a lot more recognition um, in the past few years because we are staying true to what wine is. Um, and we're, you know, especially now that as a whole um, with the U.S. going more natural and going more organic and, and hands off, uh, it's been kind of cool to see with, with wine how small production has really showcased that and it's been steady to that and hold true to that. So it's been kind of cool. I think I think that all um, all the four others on this panel, the four of us, are very excited for COVID to be over, and we're going to go and do a vertical with you right away. I'm just inviting like myself and, and my my three other new buddies well, here. Well, you you beat we're me going to, it to you. Well, I, you beat me to it because I was going to reach Ooh. out to all of you and be like, "Hey, you guys all need to come over, and we need to share wine because it sounds like we're all on the same page." <laughs> we're coming. We're, we're coming. I like it. Like, just let me us. know when works for everybody. The day, you know, I'm the happy day after, over. it's okay. We're coming. Yeah, we're exactly. Coming. Awesome. Cannot wait. <laughs> awesome. Well, on to um, uh, Bacigalupi Vineyards and Nicole, would you like to um, introduce your library wine, please? Sure. So um, we are offering or have here the 2015 um, Bacigalupi Chardonnay. And I had a hard time picking a wine for this because Frankly, we don't have a lot of library wines, so kind of like Cecilia, you know, we have limited storage and, you know, these wines could go pretty quick. So there's 24 bottles of this precious nectar, um, which uh, I'm happy to share with you guys. So um, I did actually bring a cluster of grapes just to kind of show people what we're working with here. So this is what we made the wine from. This is a Winty Clone Chardonnay cluster. Um, and as you can see, it's really unique because you have these like very tiny berries and then you have these kind of big berries all on the same bunch. And so um, this is called hens and chicks. So this is the Wenty clone and this bunch morphology is very indicative of this clone. And um, what I love about 
of how this translates to the Chardonnay is the texture it gives because you have these very small berries that typically are infertile and they give these this beautiful kind of pop of acidity and freshness and then you have the bigger berries which are typically a little bit more unctuous and round and rich and when you get that all together you get this beautiful layering and complexity um, that for Russian River we're just so well known for um, and I just love in Chardonnay. And you did show, I think you were showing, unless it's just a trick of the eye there, was that a magnum? So they, the library wine is a magnum form or is that no, just- No, this isn't a magnum. Regular it's like, it's okay. the optics in the I was like, oh. iPad look bigger than they yeah. appear, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, it did. I was like, ooh, magnums are fun. I want to watch a Enrique Chardonnay magnum. That sounds I like wish. a party. We're coming to bring, well, can you bring it on our trip when we go to Enrique's? Yes. When Enrique's we cellars and you bring- yeah, I'll bring, bring them. Them. Yes. That'd be awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Nicole. You're the best. Yeah. That's very cool. And so I love I love how you described um uh the Wenty Wenty selection because it's so so very true about that. So is this particular um is this particular library a wine a hundred percent your Wenty clone or did you have any yes. other okay? Awesome. It's all Wenty. In fact, that's all we have on the property. Uh, we just converted mm -hmm. all of our clone for a Chardonnay that we had to Wenty. So that's um, exclusively what we're farming right now because we love it so well, much. <laughs> that's a huge, that's a huge commitment to quality to take out yeah. a more production clone and put in a clone that's more quality focused. So that's, that's, that's a huge, that's a huge mark on Dutch Groupie there. That's, that's awesome. It Very makes, cool. it really, honestly, when you compare the two, there's no comparison, I think, just for my personal opinion, obviously, um, with the two. And, and we want to make the best wine that comes from the best grapes, so. And then, so if you can describe to um, all the viewers the style of Chardonnay you make, because, you know, Chard some Chardonnays can be very low oak or minimal oak. Some Chardonnays can be a lot of oak and a lot of mal malolactic fermentation and be very creamy in texture. So where to describe to people where you fall in that? Yes, where do we lie? So the way that I kind of explain it to guests is we make a classic California, but we do a modern take on it. Um, and that you've heard from most of the panelists, you know, we're really trying to stay true to the vineyard. Um, so minimal intervention is really how we approach all of our wines, but you'll see it especially apparent in the Chardonnay. Um, we use a native ambient fermentation in oak, so we do not add a prefabricated manufactured yeast strain. It is all yeast that naturally occur within the vineyard. Um, and so that's first kind of how we approach the fermentation. And then um, in barrel, it's about eight months. It is a 50% new French oak and then 50% of a neutral and then used barrel. Um, so it's it's down the middle, I would say for oak percentage and really um, we use primarily Francois Ferrer. And for me personally, the oak is really, it's a spice rack. Um, it's a highlighter for the fruit. So we're using it to bring that really pure, fresh fruit characteristics to the front of the wine. Um, we want it really just to accentuate and express what's already there. Um, and then we do a full malolactic on it, but we put it to bottle unfiltered and unfined. All right, there's that one. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's extremely- That was a forklift, important. wasn't it? That was, yeah. that sounded like forklift, it's harvest. I know. Yes. I was like, oh, that's a, yeah, a, that's a forklift. going on right now. Um, you just got forklift bombed on your Zoom. <laughs> Congratulations, it's harvest. That. Yeah. Uh, yes. So yeah, awesome. pure raw fruit expression is what we're going for. Very cool. Very cool. Thank you. Well, on to Pellegrini. Alexia, could you please uh, tell us about the library wine selection you have today? Uh, yes, so the library wine that um, I am uh, discussing today is our Olivet Lane uh, Pinot Noir from the 2013 vintage. So this is from our original 20 acres of Pinot planted in 75, um, which are is Martini clone and has been um, for many years the source for William Selly and Mary Edwards who have uh, bought these grapes and done a uh, uh, vineyard designate with them. Uh, so our style for winemaking, as I mentioned, unadorned, um, we do all of our fermentation in a five top open, uh, five ton tank open top fermentation with hydraulic punch down. Uh, we use as few pumps as possible in the process. So we'll barrel down via gravity um, and our barrel program all, always all French and low oak use um, and rarely medium plus so only French barrels and are in our in our cellar. 
this is a particularly special vintage for me as well because um, I came back in 2013 having finished my design degree. I had left for uh, five years and had my quarter life crisis. <laughs> And uh, and uh, this was the return to run the business, um, just myself and my dad. Um, so the other family members had wanted to retire and they had uh, worked out their retirement plan and my dad asked me to come back. Um, so it from that point forward, it was less trying to like work around, you know, multiple people that had interests in the winery, but were not on site. Um, and and to really make my my, my own um, statement, and uh, also the packaging, the label for this is um, something that my sister and I uh, worked on together. So we had done a full rebrand on the Olivet Lane label together, um, which was very special. Um, and from that point forward, though, my sister had two kids, and I couldn't get turnaround time for a design file. So I was like, I can do this. <laughs> you, you knew you knew you knew when to cut her loose that was very yeah, smart yeah, so that was very smart for a text change i'm like i can open up that file let's yeah. just go for it awesome well I, you know i would normally ask you about the style of of the pinot noir and i, I will i promise i will but kind of keep it on that thread what what is your design aesthetic with this particular label what were you aiming for on it um well, for us, uh, we were trying to focus, refocus the Olivet Lane label to make it stand apart from the Pellegrini brand, which actually, you know, in some rebranding, uh, uh, sometimes rebranding is not always smart because at that point I realized that we were divorcing ourselves from our biggest asset. So I brought back some of those design aspects in the later vintage. Um, but uh, really just a refresh at that point because we felt like this was new for us and uh, us making a new a new approach for the brand and i mean i don't have all the labels here to share you i have them in my office on, on in a in a row there's um there's you know there's ties together with the branding changes over the years. I love the 1984 Olivet Lane, which is just like neon lettering. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, but uh, um, I think uh, one of the wines that I grabbed because I didn't know I had sent in a specific wine, but um, I had grabbed the 18, well, see this picture is not gonna let me do it. I'd done our, uh, all of it Lane, Rosé and Nouveau packaging um, in, for the 18 vintage. And um, I've, I'm kind of carrying over that through some of the new lines. I haven't finished our sparkling labels yet, um, but uh, you know, having a little bit of fun and diversity with that. And I think the next Pellegrini Rosé, I have a, a friend that's commissioned to do that front label as an art piece, just for fun. Very cool. I love the I love the incorporation of art into labels. I think it's another form of expression that you know the wine industry has access to, and it's nice to see it exercised. Okay, so very quickly, I do have to ask you the style because just as with Chardonnay and the and the Bacigalupi Chardonnay, total there's a total you know a, a, a continuum of styles with Pinot Noir. You can go for a, a leaner, more you know not necessarily elegant, but a leaner style, a little more fruit driven with a little more red fruit qualities. And it can go as far as, you know, very dark fruit complex. So where does uh, this style for your library wine, where's that style of Pinot Noir live? So Martini clone, it's an heirloom clone and known for being more uh, perfumed than it is punchy, uh, like the Dijon clones. Um, I think the age of the vineyard really contributes to that lingering finish and the complexity of it. And so we try not to overshadow um, any, any of the characteristics that are, are, are built out in the vineyard. And, and that thread is common through whoever we sell these grapes to, whether and their treatments may be different, um, but you know, extended maceration is not in fashion anymore. You know, tried that in the early 2000s when that came out, but uh, it's really, uh, I don't do bags of tannins. I don't do bags of chips. I don't do any additives that would mask what is created in the vineyard. And when I see that kind of stuff, it just 
kind of makes me a little sick. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a, it's a technique not, not, not left for Pellegrini or probably anybody on this, on our panel. So yeah, there's a time and place. There's a time and place. Yeah. Thank you, Alexia. Well, um, Alan, um, are you able to illuminate us on your library wine selection tonight? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I picked out the uh, Woolsey Road Vineyard for, for everybody. So um, quick history of Woolsey. We worked with a vineyard called Hyde Vineyard over in Carneros in Napa. And, um, and that was the one that we got on the top 10 wines in the world for Spectator with. And then we, Larry Hyde was nice enough to let us use the Budwood Wente clone, as Nicole explained what that is. But we took the Budwood of that Wente selection, one of the better selections over there, and had this vineyard plat planted uh, that we were able to get fruit fun for some time. And we were lucky enough to get on deep, the front cover of Decanter for that one. And then we took the Budwood from that Wente selection and made this vineyard, Woolsey Road. So it's got a, a great history. And we, um, we used um, my dad's and uh, my family's old bit consultant, Daniel Roberts, who's this very, you know, we call him Dr. I mean, he's, he's this Yale educated, very serious man who, who knows, you know, sort of like I explained my dad knowing if I asked him a question, oh, I did that study in the 80s. Oh, I did that study. Same deal. So he sort of came together and worked with the Martinelli family. The Martinelli's, it's on their land. They're great, you know, uh, multi-generation growers in this area. So they were very kindly, as they were needed to new place to, to get some vineyards, came to us because we have a long-term relationship. We'll let you design a vineyard um, on our property and you, you get the fruit. And we have said absolutely yes. So that's when we took the Budwood and we used Dan Roberts and got some input from my dad and, and everybody and worked with them and, and got basically our textbook dream vineyard um, from this great historical um, sources and planted ev everything we wanted right, right dead center in the Russian river, really right, right behind their, their wine around um, kind of close to river road, if you're, you know that area very well. Um, so we've been making this wine for, some time it took us a while some years of age before we could put it in a single vineyard but once the the vines got old enough we were ready for it to go and i picked out 2014 for 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 folks because it's not you know our, it's it's an interesting phase you know you're, you're asking about pinot styles our chardonnays you know when they're 20 years old for example get just exuberantly rich and nutty and, and creamy versus when they're young they're much more acidic and vibrant and fresh and, and 14 is an interesting point where it sort of, you know, balances that it, it hints at a little bit of that kind of nuttier creaminess, but also it still has kind of a nice vibrance to it. So it's, that's, it's, I, I like drinking them in sort of that, that range right now. And so that's why I picked out this one for you. Awesome. Wonderful. And then um, before we let you off the hook, since you explained everything I could possibly want to know about your library selection, <laughs> which is great. So thank you for being thorough. Um, very quickly, it, what, what would you pair? Would, are you into food pairing? Do you eat? I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a little bit of a belly you down here. You're like, so, I'm, I'm hiding you it off like the a... camera. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I can't take advantage of that. Yeah. I haven't so, had what, lunch since you... lunchtime. Um, oh, okay. Well, it's harvest. I don't know. I, I think I think I ate lunch. I can't remember if I did today. To be honest, I have no clue. Um, so um, I probably was driving and ate something. But um, so, what would you pair? Uh, what would you pair this wine with? Because you were talking about it's so interesting because you chose a fourteen. You know, it's six years old. It's on that knife's edge of of you know. I have a little bit of the older characters and the creaminess of the characters, but I still have the vibrancy of acid. So how how would you pair that up? You know, it's it's I would you know just as long as it's with the acidity, you want to make sure it, it can sort of, it's nice to have something with a little bit of fat it can sort of cut through. But at the same time, because it's got a little bit of that, that age to it, it's, it, 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 it has kind of a nice richness so that can pair with, with lighter things as well. So, you know, I honestly, I really enjoy it with, with cheeses. Some sort of a burrata or something like a light fresh cheese is, is great. I mean, the nice thing about Chardonnay is that it, it can accomplish so many things. I mean, Odds are you do something, you're not going to strike out. You know, that's the, the honest truth of it. But when I get a good, a nice fresh cheese, I, I generally I find that that's when I'm in my, my happy place in life is when, when I've got that. So that's, that's my usual. I love that. That's great. Awesome. Um, so we have a couple of questions um, that have been coming in. So I'm going to start reviewing them and look completely distracted as I talk to you. Um, and while I do that, um, other questions, though, um, are uh, one person asked a question about um, uh, handpick or machine harvest. And um, so uh, 
I don't know. I, I don't think everyone watching this can see everybody. I think they, you're highlighted as you speak. So Cecilia, do you mind us starting us off? Um, and it's probably, I'm going to presume it's a com, some people are combos. So thoughts. Uh, so historically, hand-picked. I prefer hand-picked fruit. Um, I did one year get really excited because we sold our grapes to a wi another winery, another producer. And um, the way the year went, they just didn't have enough, like, they were strapped for time. So they just sent out machines. And I was like, oh, this is exciting. I get to see what machines do in um, machine-picked fruit. And I wanted to take photos and videos and I had to go back inside because I was like freaking out for how hard they were on the vines and I couldn't end up watching it. So it was not a, as exciting since since then. Um, definitely handpicked. Funny story though, that's not vineyard that I get for because it's a bigger vineyard. Um, I just assumed it was gonna be handpicked and it came in machine harvested. Luckily their machine was very old and so it came in with like full on canes. So we actually, my husband and I, who also happens to make wine, um, under his own brand and company. Um, we spent three hours digging through two bins to literally cut the full clusters off and like it ended up being full cluster, which was awesome. But um, yeah, I'm all about handpicked this year. I'm definitely gonna specify that I need it to be handpicked um, so that we don't make that mistake again because three hours was a very long time to shift through two bins. <laughs> On behalf of our industry, I apologize for that machine load and I take full responsibility. <laughs> Thank you for making lemonade out of lemons on that. Yeah, I'm just, you know, it's just, it's, it was disappointing. I, I freaked out the first time I saw it. I am all about handpicked and, you know, there's nothing wrong with machines. It's just, it can be more efficient and, you know, whatnot. But for me personally, I prefer handpicked. Gotcha. And Nicole, what are your thoughts? Handpicked versus machine harvested? Um, so on the property, we do everything by hand, um, you know, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay are especially susceptible to, um, you know, bruising and we want fruit to come to the winery at the um, utmost quality. So all of our vineyards are set up for only hand. We don't have accessibility for machine. We do a really big canopy and so there's no way a machine could even get into the fruit zone. Um, as Cecilia mentioned, the shaker machines are really hard on the vines and um, they can scar the um, roots and they can scar the canes, which will leave um, that for susceptibility of pests and disease. Um, and so in, you know, um, to sustain these properties and these vineyards for their health and for, um, you know, future generations, we choose to do things by hand. It's a lot harder, it's a lot longer. Um, it takes a long time to pick the Pinot and Chardonnay. They're very small bunches, they don't weigh up. Um, so we start at 10 p.m. We work all night through. Um, it's cold, so it's comfortable for the workers, for the pickers. Um, and then we usually have the winery, the grapes at the winery at around 7 a.m., nice and cold, ready for the fermenters. Wine makers are happy. Um, we're able to get the fruit really clean, so no leaves, no mog, no material other than grapes. Um, and we have two leaf pullers also at the bins, just watching for um, you know any botrytis if that does come through. But there's no substitution for the human eye when it comes to picking something like wine grapes. And it is a skill. I mean, these are skilled workers that are in our vineyard and um, we're really happy and fortunate to have them. And I'm just strategically skipping Alexia because I have a different question for her and I'm hoping Alan will help me out. Machine harvest or hand pick thoughts? Oh, we, we do we do hand as well, and I, I, I ditto the comments before. The, the only color I'll add is that the technology has, has gotten a lot better, and, and from what I understand, it, it should, that trajectory should go up. I mean, I was in, in Burgundy a couple of years ago chatting with Daniel Letian de Fay, the, the kind of famed uh, Chablis producer, and he was starting to move over to those, and he, we're talking about vineyards that used to go to the Kings, the Louis, and so this is not cheap stuff, but some folks in the world that make good wine are starting to think more about it. So at this point we're hand, but you know, we, we always check in on the, the technology to see how things are changing. Um, so hand by now, but always, always look to see what could be new and interesting. And Alexia, I skipped you because I presumed with your old heritage vines that I was perhaps wasting my time asking you about that. I but to block uh, specifically for machining though, recently. That's Awesome. Yeah. Old vines, no way. We could never do that. 
And what type of machine did you use? Were you, did you have an optical sorter on board or was it a straight machine harvester? Um, haven't, um, uh, we haven't used it yet. We did handpick for the first, um, for, it's the first uh, harvest off that block. But with the rising um, costs of um, labor, the um, competition for labor, especially when we've had so many homes that had to be rebuilt and the weed industry coming online, um, it seemed to be a, a, a thinking towards the future. And then specifically with that block, it being for sparkling rosé, um, sparkling rosé, which we can take that in as um, um, destemmed quite easily. So um, I'm not using it yet. I'm not buying any fruit from vineyards in that realm. And uh, but I've seen it happening next door at another vineyard, and uh, it is definitely better. Twenty years ago, when I was in South Australia, getting 20 tons an hour working at Pinfolds, there was all sorts of stuff coming in, like, you know, snails, the si same size as uh, uh, berries that would be just littered throughout the, and even a bike got dropped in the hopper because it was tied to an end of a vine post. So it, it has gotten better, but not yet. My, my worst thing I've ever found in a load in my career was a file cabinet. It's a long story. We'll talk about it when we visit Cecilia post harvest. Um, I we we're going to start wrapping up, but I um, one thing I was asked I would love to ask of all of you is as uh, what, what we're calling at this point in time new generation. So you're the new generation, and at a certain point in time, you're going to be as old and crusty and jaded as I am. And at that point in time, I want you to promise me that you will mentor people because all of your experiences are so incredible and so rich in not only history, but your own personal history and also pioneering all four of you in your own right. And so please promise me that you'll mentor when you, when you get to that post. Um, and in the meantime, I would love to hear from all of you who your mentor was. And I know it's hard to narrow it down to one. So if you got a slide in two or three, I, I'm okay with that. But, um, uh, Miss Cecilia, who is your who or who are or is your mentor? Um, I think it's I've got I, I actually was asked this question um, recently by somebody that was doing an article and it, it I really can't say that one person or even three people were a mentor because I because I didn't know anything I literally was asking anybody that I was coming across. I mean, I was going out there when the vineyard guys were out in the vineyard asking them what they were doing. Luckily, I'm fluent in Spanish, so it helped facilitate the conversation a lot faster. Um, but I was out there trying to figure out why they were doing certain things, how they were doing it. I tried doing what they were doing. Um, we were fortunate that we had a production facility that we had acquired with the property and it was leased to another winery. So that winemaker was hands-on on teaching me how to check bricks and, um, his philosophy was the berry way. So I still incorporate that, even though my husband does the cluster way. And I'm just like, I don't know. I don't know if I could switch over. Um, you know, there's a couple other wineries that we've come across most recently. Um, I'm right next to Kent Ritchie in Russian River on East Side Road. So I go over there and ask him a million one questions. He actually asked us a million one questions because he thought we weren't actually doing any of the work ourselves. Um, and we really kind of had to prove ourselves to even be friends with him as our neighbor. Um, most recently, the Rod, I mean, from Joseph Swan, I, that's where I first discovered to not. And last year, he must have gotten so sick of me because I was, and, and he's on the way to the winery because we, we produce in, in Sebastopol. So um, I don't know how many times I stopped over there. And I was like, wait, tell me again about to not and how do you make it and what I should be doing, what I shouldn't be doing. The fruit's coming from this area. You know, your fruit is from a different area. And he's just like, pretty much his word of advice was literally take everything that you have learned and throw it out the window to not does not work like every other varietal. So um, I, I mean, just to name a few, because there's, there's just so many people, everybody I've come into contact really has been, has been a mentor to, to me. Beautiful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Nicole, uh, who, who is or who are your mentors? Well, um, I mean, I would have to say I was thinking as Cecilia was talking about like who specifically and um, my grandmother Helen is 95 and she's worked in this industry for 65 years. So she has definite opinions <laughs> about the industry and I've been able to absorb and like be a sponge as Alan said with um, her 
her knowledge and um, how she's experienced and seen this industry change. And um, my father and my mother, you know, uh, my father basically started here at 14 um, and he's well read and he's really um, just kind of taught me and my sister the best routes to go. And um, I will also echo, echo Cecilia, you know, the community that we have here is really amazing. Um, we help each other and we're really very collaborative. Um, we're fortunate to be on this wonderful road where we've got the Rocchiolis and Alan and the Martinelli's and, um, you know, Raffinelli's are just down the street. So we're fortunate we have this like great think tank of farmers and growers that if we do need advice or help, um, you know, they're just a phone call away and they, they are willing to give advice. And if there's issues, you can always reach out. And, and that's what's so great about this community is we're all here to help each other. But definitely Grandma Helen, she's an icon. Um, she's, you know, my, my mentor and probably always will be. Very sweet. Alexia, who is, who is or who are your mentors? Well, um, first and foremost, I have to say my dad, who I asked him, like, do you want to be on film? And he's like, no. He's got to, no, he's got to come. Come on. No, I'm begging. Come on, dad. We got to see him. It's, this is like, it's, we've been, we've been teasing the dad for an hour. Come on, Papa Bear. Uh, I'm Mr. Pellegrini. No, he's not coming. Okay. Yeah, he's, he's I tried. Hanging out. But I mean, from a very young age, um, in, um, I learned things about the wine business that, um, since he really grew up in the distribution side of things in San Francisco, started with, you know, like, you know, these are all the back doors of all the restaurants you want to go to and sit at the bar right in front of the well, order your own wine, <laughs> things that nine-year-olds shouldn't know. Um, but as, when I got into making wine, it was all the stupid questions that I could ask um, the people that were around me that were not my family that would answer them. Um, without judgment. Um, so uh, Kevin Hamill had been our winemaker at the time and I had a lot of, you know, like, can we grow grapevines in greenhouses to stop phylloxera? Things like that <laughs> when I'm 21 years old. Um, uh, Mary Edwards, who's been my dad's longest working partner um, in his life, and she has helped me immensely, especially on the viticultural side um, for all the changes that I, I've um, tackled with farming. And, um, and currently I work really closely with Jeff Mangahas at um, William Selliam um, for continuing with Mary retiring. We are working on the farming programs and in improving on a regular basis. Very cool, very cool. And Alan, please illuminate us with your mentors, our mentor. Yeah, no, I, I'm lucky that I've got multiple. I mean, I from going abroad, you know, I, I learned an, enough French to ask some questions in, in French. And so Jean-Nicolas um, Jean Mayo in Burgundy, who was my boss over there, was able to, I booked him probably, you know, just like folks are saying, probably too much. Um, and then, you know, out here, you know, our, you know, since I was a kid, I've known Daniel Roberts, our, our longtime viticultural help. And he I'm at the point where we were walking vineyards and he gives me homework now. So I, you know, and he, and rather, when I ask him questions, he just asks me the question back. And so I'm getting a, a, that, that to me is the, the best education. And then uh, of course my folks, you know, um, from, uh, you know, my, my dad, obviously, you know, for, from his decades of winemaking, but also my, my mom for her business savvy, who I don't think gets the credit she's, she's due. I mean, I've, there's a, uh, you know, questions I'll have, for example, I took over insurance for the, the winery and I remember looking at, insurance healthcare plans and showing her the options and she said well obviously we want this one they're they're employees we we obviously get the best for for the employees we have and it's little things like that that i think are underappreciated in the sort of sexy world of wine but i think matter just as much in the grand scheme of, of life and so yeah I, I sort of glossed over my dad a little bit but certainly i i, I bug him a lot he sends me <laughs> I bug him a lot, and then he, he just sends me articles all day long that I have to keep reading, um, and and uh, and so I I, I I keep up where I can. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thank you guys. We're going to wrap it up here. So thank you all four of you for your time and and being so so open with your stories. It was such a very cool look into your 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 wineries, your families, and into yourself. So thank you, thank you.
And um, for anybody who's still viewing, please look into the chat option um, on this Zoom and you can find out the information uh, to purchase these amazing and talented uh, new generation winemakers wines. So thank you everybody. Um, I'm wishing you all a very safe and uh, successful and happy end to uh, this harvest, which is presenting several challenges, which is no surprise, it's 2020. Um, and um, I can't wait for all of us to get together at Cecilia's Winery and uh, drink a bunch of magnums that Nicole's bringing. So this is a great day. Thank you all and take care.